All right, so let's get going on uh, today's class. So um, what we're going to be doing today is a sort of applied version of um, uh, operational conditioning. Uh, we're going to take a look at some previously uh, encountered topics. We're going to take a look at some new topics, and we're going to apply them to a specific example to uh, illustrate them, which is gambling behavior and gambling addiction. But before we get to that, on to uh, step four of the social media assignment. And what we're going to be doing for step four, and this is going to be for the next few steps, we're going to continue that idea of giving before uh, taking for your uh, network. So, so far this has been uh, really well done. So this is an example of one of the retweets uh, that has been uh, done. And again, at this stage in your, uh, in your academic career, at this stage in your psychology career, you might not have a lot of original content uh, that you can um, that you can provide. You're not, you know, necessarily doing research. You don't necessarily have best practices in terms of how to teach psychology. Uh, you might not have a lot of material that you yourself can provide that's original. But you can definitely start helping out your network, start helping out your community by promoting their ideas, by amplifying uh, their statements. So. That's a great way, again, to uh, become part of this and to start building your, uh, your network and also to start building your professional profile so that employers and grad schools later on see that you have an active social media profile. And yes, all of the things that you talk about in your professional profile are psychology, psychology related, indicating that clear interest to help, them, uh, to help convince them to hire or accept you. So that's what we're going to keep doing now. Uh, for the next little while. So because this is going to be an extended period of time, because we got fall break, we're going to be doing four retweets from any of the psychologists uh, that you currently follow. If you want to follow new ones, feel free to do that uh, as well. So it'll be four this time. And uh, once again, no comments uh, are required other than the uh, assignment hashtag. But if you do want to comment, if you're starting to feel comfortable enough to uh, you know, contribute that, then definitely read the do's and don'ts of networking online. It's a PDF that is available in Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, would that have information about uh, like who you should follow and who you shouldn't follow and follow back and all of that stuff? Um, the do's and don'ts of networking? Yeah. Or is that just more how you should That's more about how I think you should interact. Okay. But the rule, the rule on sort of who to follow, who to follow back, and in terms of what to post is an excellent question. Um, what you want to do is you want to make sure that your account has a consistent message. So if you're following people for this one, we're building a professional psychology account, you would want to follow other psychologists and they can be psychologists at any stage of their development uh, in their career. So it could be top tier you know, psychologists that are doing TED Talks. It could be grad students at a, you know, uh, pursuing their uh, PhD. It could be other undergrads, you know, but you want to make sure that you're following uh, people that are in that sort of psychology area. And then in terms of posting things, you want to make sure that you post things that are psychology uh, related. So in terms of following people back, uh, as you kind of build your, your network, you'll notice that some people will post a lot of useful information and that will go into your feed. Other people will post not so useful information. Then if you follow them, that will go into your feed as well. So that's one of the reasons why when you follow somebody, uh, you know, maybe take a look at what they've been posting about. And if they're posting a lot of interesting psychology stuff, absolutely follow them for your professional feed. If they're posting a lot of things about their cat, maybe on your personal Twitter, if that's what you're interested in, but you don't really want to clutter up your own feed. And that's also the reason why you uh, want to make sure that your profile has a consistent theme. So on your profile, make sure that you're only really posting about psychology things. It can be anything, like psychology is a wide field, so it can be anything that's of interest to psychologists, but try to keep that, um, try to keep that consistent. So for example, uh, one of the um, people that I followed he was uh, he's specializing in uh, social marketing. That was his area. But he also loved sailing. Uh, he was a boat enthusiast, and he would post boat uh, information as well. So when I followed him, I got this mix of interesting psychology stuff that I could use, 
and the latest version of you know, the 2019 model of this particular boat and all its features. And uh, what happened was that at one point, he sent out an announcement that he was starting a separate Twitter account for his boating interests. And I think what was happening is that he realized that he, his message was getting diluted and he was cluttering up people's inbox and their feeds because they, didn't, they weren't following him for the boating, they were following him for the social marketing. So that's not what you want. You don't want to burden people with, oh, here's all this other stuff other than what you're following. So if you find that a professor is doing that, like say you followed somebody and all of a sudden you, you know more about their cat than about their research, you know, definitely you can, you can unfollow them and uh, you know, look for people more in line with that particular interest. But every decision that you make for your social media profile is all about benefiting you the most in psychology. So you want it to be about psychology, you want your posts to be about psychology. And again, psychology is so broad that almost anything will touch psychology at some point, but you do want to make sure that it's that theme uh, for, your, uh, for your account. So, uh, and then this, this thing does have um, information more on uh, retweeting um, controversial information and controversial stuff. There's, there's more, isn't there? <laughs> Sorry. The next little amount. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, in terms of controversy and, um, you know, things like that, um, just be aware, I mean, there are certain things that you definitely don't want to uh, get involved with, definitely don't want to address. Um, and uh, when you're retweeting, uh, I would recommend at this point, kind of keep it um, not, uh, like I said, not controversial. So uh, one, of, one of the psychologists that comes to my mind is Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson is split like right, you know, the people that absolutely adore him, love him, and send him hundreds of thousands of dollars on, um, uh, it used to be uh, Patreon, but uh, he started up his own thing, and, and there's people that absolutely despise him. And if you follow him, and if you retweet his, uh, you know, some of his uh, tweets, um, when you go and apply to a grad school, when you go to apply to, you know, a job, you're, you're kind of taking that 50-50 shot, right? That, oh, are they gonna be a supporter? Are they gonna be something that's not a supporter? Whereas if you choose less controversial figures, then it's, it's much more beneficial to you in that regard. So I would say if you're wondering, should I follow this individual, should I not follow this individual? At this stage, as you're kind of building your, your network and, and contributing to the community, maybe err on the side of not follow, you know, for the, for the period of time. All right, so. Uh, so again, yeah, you want to retweet uh, for the tweet from any psychologist that you follow and uh, make sure, again, that it's about psychology information. So they're posting their latest research, they're posting a link to a talk that they gave, uh, they're posting advice on what to do uh, you know, in a classroom, all that is fine. And this time we're going to use the hashtag next, next gen Psych 2019 uh, for these particular four. So the last time it was Future Psych 2019, this time we're going next gen site, uh, just so that we can keep track of those different stages. So that's part one of the social media development for this for this week. Part two is actually uh, part of my big ask. So hopefully uh, I've helped build this community uh, enough that uh, the big ask will uh, be appropriate at this time. But uh, my big ask for this is I have a uh, student. Where is he? That guy right there. So that's uh, Christopher Crawford. And he uh, graduated, he is currently a uh, research assistant at uh, IU um, uh, Medical School, and uh, we're doing a research project uh, together, and we will be sending out very soon, hopefully either today or tomorrow, we'll be sending out a recruitment tweet for uh, participants in this uh, experiment. So it's being cleared by the IRB, so we're all ready to go, we're just waiting for the final word. And uh, what I would like you to do, if you uh, would help us out, is to uh, retweet this uh, to just help us out with uh, subject recruitment. So just so that we are absolutely clear, I am not asking you at all to participate in this experiment. So it is unethical actually for me to ask you to do this experiment because you're my, uh, currently my students and that's kind of like a coercive thing. I don't want you to, uh, you're not allowed to participate in research if you feel that it's coercive. So, just to be clear, this is not asking you 
to click on that link and do the, you know, do the, uh, the survey. That's not what I'm asking at all. But what I am asking and what is ethically allowed is to just retweet this to help get the word out, to help spread uh, the subject of recruitment. So if you could do that, and this is also a nice way, once again, to get involved with the research community. So people that might follow you, uh, employers later on might see this tweet and say, oh, well, this person says that they're interested in psychology research. And look, here they were helping out a fellow psychology researcher. So for that one, if you are uh, so inclined to help us out, uh, two hashtags on that, uh, research opportunity, IUSB, that's going to help us keep track of the, um, that's going to help us keep track of this particular uh, involvement. And then hashtag comics on Twitter, that's a hashtag for people that uh, are interested in issues like scientific uh, research on comics on Twitter, that's a hashtag that they use. So that'll be a nice way for them to identify this as well. So if you can use those two, and uh, this is going to be due not this Monday, but next Monday. So we have an elongated uh, period of time for this because of the uh, fall break. And uh, yeah, Monday, October 28th, if you can help out with those two stages for our social media development stage four. Any questions on that? All right. So what we're going to do now is we are going to uh, continue our look at uh, chapter seven, but this is going to be a sort of look at chapter seven using some of the concepts from chapter six and then foreshadowing and kind of giving you a, a preview of some of the things we're going to be doing in chapter eight. So it really is a sort of integrative look at uh, operant conditioning and theories of reinforcement. And we're going to apply it to a specific case, which is gambling addiction so, and gambling behavior. So we're going to see why is it that this behavior uh, that can be so very harmful is actually produced by very basic, regular conditioning procedures. So we're going to take a look at the procedures that underlie it. We are finally going to answer the reason why slot machines uh, are designed to have that gradual reveal to whether or not you're the winner. So there was, there used to be a mechanical reason in terms of randomizing the outcomes, why the first tumbler had to stop and then the second one had to stop and then the third one had to stop. But these days when it's all computerized, there is no reason whatsoever why the first column has to stop and then the second column has to stop and then the third column has to stop. It could just flash a, uh, a screen and say, you won or it could flash a screen and say, you did not win. So why is it that they still do that gradual progression? We'll take a look at that as well. And then also in the treatment of um, gambling addiction, uh, and also the treatments of other addictions, so Alcohol Anonymous has this principle as well as part of its treatment program. One of the ideas is that you do not go back to the environment where you had that particular addictive behavior. So for example, this, blog here, blog post from uh, an individual that was going through the um, AA program, was asking uh, if when you're getting sober, can you still go to bars? And the advice that uh, he remembers getting from uh, the, his AA meeting was no, to not go back to bars. So uh, if you, you know, if you don't want a haircut, stay out of the barbershop, uh, old timers in AA who will tell you going anywhere in early sobriety where they serve booze is like square dancing in a minefield and we're going to see why that is actually the case, why well, it's a great idea if you are recovering from an addictive behavior to not go back to that uh, area at the very least when you're in the process of uh, recovery. Alright, so we're going to get to that but uh, before we get to that I do have the exams graded I'm going to be posting those soon. Uh, we're just waiting on a few uh, makeup exams uh, to be finished. But I do want to, speaking of reinforcement, to uh, uh, give a little bit of uh, reinforcement uh, specifically for the review session. So uh, I was always trying to figure out what can we do about exam two, because exam two typically does have slightly lower scores than on exam one. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the improvement in scores from students that came uh, to the review session. Uh, it was very gratifying to know that for section one, 
it was about 14% uh, uh, improvement on section one. For section two, it was about 15%, and that was like a 14 and a half percent overall. So an entire letter grade and a half better because of the uh, review session. So definitely gonna keep that going in. Um, as a educator, I tried the behavior of the review session. I got reinforced with uh, the consequence of grades have gone up. That makes me more likely to do it in the future. And hopefully uh, it'll make everybody else here more likely to attend these kinds of review sessions in the future as well. So I will be posting those grades uh, very soon and we'll be giving them back uh, once the fall break is done. All right, back to gambling. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a look at practical applications of operational conditioning. So we've seen a little bit of these applications. Now we're gonna kind of do an overview of a bunch of different uh, aspects of, um, of operating conditioning to see how they're affecting uh, gambling behavior. Some of these, like magazine training, were not in the textbook, so that'll be completely new. Uh, some of them, like shaping, uh, we've already touched on. Uh, the adjusting schedule, that's uh, new as well. Extinction uh, is coming up, so that's gonna be a preview of the next uh, chapter that we're looking at. And then again, uh, secondary reinforcement, reinforce some of those ideas and spontaneous recovery as well. So we're gonna start out with magazine training. And this, one was, this was a concept that wasn't mentioned in the book, wasn't mentioned in your text, but it's a very important concept in the practical application of training. And what magazine training does is it's a procedure that you do before the operant conditioning. So if you want to train a rat to press a bar, this procedure goes before you start teaching them how to press a bar. And it's a procedure where the sound of the actual food dispenser is conditioned uh, to be a secondary reinforcer uh, by pairing it with food. So you're turning the sound of the delivery mechanism, so the actual uh, tray that lifts up so that the rat can access it, that makes a sound. And what you're doing is you're pairing that sound with the delivery of food, and you turn that sound into a secondary reinforcer. So that's magazine training. And what we're gonna do to illustrate this is, uh, this is a simulation program uh, that I have that sim simulates a virtual rat in a Skinner box, in a training environment. So this is the next best thing you can have to an actual live rat if you're doing um, behaviorist uh, types of interactions. Actually, it's a little bit better because I remember in my undergrad uh, and um, in grad school, we actually, at the University of Toronto, we have an animal laboratory uh, where we had this experience. And unlike a virtual rat, real rats will bite you and they will urinate on you. <laughs> so this is actually a little bit safer. But the reason I wanted to use this is because it's got this nice little feature here, which is the mind window uh, for what's going, in, uh, what's going on inside of your rat's mind. So this mind window here is uh, gonna be a representation of the association between, for example, the sound of the hopper and the food. It's gonna be an association between pressing the bar and the sound, and it's gonna be the association of how uh, the um, strength of the bar press. So the higher the bar, basically, the stronger those associations and that learning is in his mind. So it's almost like you can take a peek into the mind of an individual as they go through the learning process, which is something also that you cannot do with a real rat. So what you would do in magazine training is you would basically uh, present the rat with food, and you would do it in a way usually where the rat is facing the food so that it would hear the sound of the hopper and then it would see the food. So much like ringing a bell and giving uh, the dog food, you would bring the hopper up, the rat would see food. So typically when you're doing this, you want to make sure that the rat is not facing away from the food. And these little uh, marks here, this is where the rat is given food for not pressing the bar. And as you can see here, in the rat's mind, as you continue through training, the association between the sound and the food becomes higher. So when that bar is at zero, that sound is a neutral stimulus. As that bar gets higher and higher through this magazine training, through this continual repetition 
of here's the sound, here's the food, here's the sound, here's the food. That bar gets much, much more uh, associated with the food, turns into a conditioned stimulus. So during conditioning, again, the sound starts as a neutral stimulus. You pair it with food, which is the unconditioned stimulus. And we take advantage of the fact in this that food is an unconditioned stimulus that causes the unconditioned response of approach. So you don't have to train this rat if it sees food to go get the food, right? The rat will go and get food. That's an unconditioned response. So in early conditioning, when there's no association, that sound is a neutral stimulus. Later in conditioning, that sound turns into a conditioned stimulus. And that's what a conditioned stimulus is. It's a strong association between the sound and the food. And what this does is it turns the sound into a secondary reinforcer. So now the sound itself can be used as a secondary reinforcer. It can be used as a reinforcer to reinforce behavior. So now the sound can actually not only cause the approach, because remember, it's a secondary reinforcer, but it's a conditioned stimulus. So it not only does it cause the conditioned response of approaching, but as that secondary reinforcer, you can actually use the sound to reinforce the approach. So when you want the rat to approach a certain area, if it approaches that area, you can click the hopper and the sound itself will reinforce the rat before the food is even delivered. So does anybody, can anybody guess at one of the big advantages of having sound as a reinforcer rather than food as a reinforcer? Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to have visual contact or eye contact with it. That's one. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be hungry. The, whoever, they, they don't have to be hungry, so you can still reinforce them after hunger. I actually didn't think of that one. But there is there is one other one. Yep. Well, that that has to do with the line of sight as well, but it has to do with speed. So the speed of sound, very, very fast, right? Speed of food, not very fast at all. So if you recall, what was a very important thing in terms of reinforcement, in terms of uh, determining associations? What type of contiguity? Spatial and temporal. So that sound decreases or increases the temporal contiguity. So if I'm trying to reinforce this rat, for pressing a bar. It might press the bar and the food pops up. It's gonna take that rat a few seconds to go get that food. But the time that it takes for the sound to reinforce that rat is gonna be instantaneous. So having that secondary reinforcer, uh, especially if it's sound, in, uh, increases your temporal contiguity and makes it much, much higher. And this is one of the reasons if you ever see dog trainers, they spend the first part of their training doing magazine training where they have a clicker in their hand. And for the first part of training a dog, all they'll do is go, here's a clicker, here's a piece of sausage. Here's a clicker, here's a dog treat. Clicker, dog treat. Clicker, dog treat. And what they do afterwards is they, associate, they um, get the clicker to be reinforcing. It's a secondary reinforcer. And that way, when they throw their Frisbee 50 feet and the dog runs over there and catches the Frisbee, they can hit that clicker instantaneously, reinforcing the dog for the frisbee throw, rather than saying, oh, here's a sausage. Why don't you spend 10 seconds coming back and then we'll reinforce you for that. So it makes it much more effective. And that is also one of the things that underlies gambling behavior and gambling addiction. So there is a reason why this place is not silent, right? There is no, gaming reason why the sounds have to be going. There's no reason for the doom, 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 you know, any of that when, uh, when the um, uh, machines are running. But there's a psychological reason for it. And the reason for it has to do with this idea of magazine training and secondary reinforcement. So the sound is a neutral stimulus. The sound gets paired with wind, right? So you have the sound of the slot machines, of that 
right? And then it comes out and it wins. And that win actually causes playing, right? So wins will be the unconditioned stimulus that'll actually cause people to continue playing. People like to do things that they're successful at. Eventually, that sound then becomes a conditioned stimulus. If you pair it with enough wins uh, that cause playing the unconditioned response, in which case the sound itself, now as a secondary reinforcer, will not only cause the conditioned response of playing, so now when they're passing by the sound, and they're like, maybe I won't play today when I come to the casino, they hear the sound and they're like, you know what, I think I will play today when I get into the casino. So it becomes a conditioned stimulus that can cause a conditioned response. But more importantly, you can't keep giving people money to play the game. Otherwise, they'll be making money instead of losing money. Otherwise, the casino would go out of business. So you have to find a way to reinforce players without actually paying them. And as much as the sound is a secondary reinforcer, they can be reinforced just by the sound. So when this individual plays his hand and he wins, he'll hear the sound and that will be reinforcing. When this individual plays his hand and that person all the way down there wins, he'll hear the sound and it will be reinforcing. And that is a way to keep reinforcing that button playing, that bar, uh, that bar pressing, without actually having to pay out any, uh, any money, without actually having to pay out any wins. And in fact, there is, um, if you uh, uh, know about the development of these slot machines, all the slot machine uh, manufacturers got together and agreed upon a musical key for their slot machines because they didn't want their slot machines to be discordant with each other. So they basically all came together and said, let's do all our sounds in the key of E. Sound good? Sounds good. So they're all able to reinforce every other slot machine without actually having to pay out any unconditioned stimulus anyways. All right, so that's magazine training. Now let's take a look at shaping. Shaping we've already encountered. And the shaping can be thought of as this gradual moving of a behavior into the complex behavior that you want to uh, eventually end up with. It's also the uh, gradual uh, increasing of an improbable target behavior by reinforcing closer approximations to that highly improbable target behavior. So if, uh, once again, we'll go into the mind of our rat here. And in this case, what we're looking for is we're looking for an increase in the association between the bar and the sound, and I believe also an increase in the action strength. This is where we're training this rat to press a bar. Now, the rat can press a bar. It's within its physical uh, abilities. And if you wait around long enough, the rat will eventually press a bar. Eventually it'll walk by the bar and it'll bump into it and the bar will press and it'll get reinforced for food. And that will be the beginning of its training to press the bar. But that can take a long time. Rats aren't natural bar pressers. So what you do when you're shaping is you would wait until the rat was success successively closer to pressing the bar and then reinforce that behavior. So for example, you might wait until the rat is close to the bar, right? So in the back half of the cage rather than the front half of the cage. And then reinforce just being in the back half of the cage. Because just being in the back half of the cage is closer to pressing the bar. And then you might stop reinforcing just being in the back half of the cage to standing up in the back half of the cage. Because standing up is closer to pressing the bar. And then you stop reinforcing just standing up and being in the back half to being in the back half of being right in front of the bar. And then eventually, the rat will stay there, will rear up, it'll start pressing the bar, and when it does and starts getting reinforced, you can see that bar press and reinforcement right there, the association between the bar, pressing the bar, and the sound of the hopper gets stronger and stronger, but importantly, the pressing of the bar, the behavior, that action strength, gets stronger and stronger as well. 
So that is shaping. We got the, the uh, rat to press the bar very quickly. And then once you get the rat pressing the bar, you can just let it go and it'll get reinforced on its own for pressing that bar. And it'll continually increase the strength of that particular bar press. That's what reinforcement uh, does. Okay, so going back to our casino. This one I'll turn over uh, and see what kind of ideas we can get. Uh, so what shaping occurs either with a casino or specifically in a casino. So the target of a casino, their end goal, the behavior that they want to shape is for you to gamble as much money as possible. That's what they want. They want high gambling rates for high gambling money. So what kind of shaping might occur either with or in a casino? Exactly, so penny slots are a great example of, of shaping. So most people, they have slot machines at all different levels. They have $100 slot machines. And I'm pretty sure, you know, some places in Vegas, they got $1,000 slot machines. And what the casinos would love would be for people to go in there and say, hey, I'm gonna play this $1,000 slot machine. Ching, and I lost, there's my $1,000, right? But that's a highly improbable behavior. I don't know too many people who would say to themselves, oh yeah, I'm going to Vegas, I'm gonna play $1,000 you know, in a slot machine. So what do they need to do? They need to shape that behavior. And a more highly probable behavior is the penny slot machines. Because who doesn't have five, six, seven cents that they can spare? So if they can get you to sit down at that penny slot machine and play a little bit, and you get reinforced for playing either through winning or through the sounds or through those other associations, then that makes you more likely to play the quarter slot machines. And once you start playing the quarter slot machines, it makes you more likely to play the dollar slot machines. And once you play the dollar slot machines, it keeps building and building until you're playing uh, the higher levels of gambling. So they can shape your behavior through those increasing amounts of, um, increasing amounts of betting limits. Uh, and that's one way to shape behavior, to go from a highly probable behavior. And I know every single time I've ever been to Vegas, Anybody that wants to try gambling for the first time will look for those penny slots. They will say, you know what, I just want to have a little bit of fun, I just want to try it. Let's go to the penny slots, I'll, I'll put in a dollar, you know, that was a fun 20 minutes or whatever. They'll start on those, right? That's a highly probable behavior and you can reinforce that and then shift through shaping through a highly improbable behavior right at the beginning, which would be like the hundred or a thousand dollar slot machines. Anything else uh, that you can think of? What is, what is one of the basic behaviors that needs to be, oh, do you have an idea? Well, I just thought about how they have um, all the bars and stuff in casinos, like the drinking. Yep. Like, that's a really big part of it, but then they have the slot machines, which are basically shaping behavior. Well, if you're, if you're drinking more, you definitely would be more careless. You definitely would lower your inhibitions. That's, that's what alcohol uh, is, is primarily used for. But um, are, are there more people that have gone out drinking than there are that have gone out gambling? Okay. Yeah, uh, would people agree with that? Yeah. Okay, so drinking is a higher probability behavior. What's one of the things that a casino has to get done? Very basic thing that they have to do before you can gamble any money at the casino. They have to get you there. You have to come to the casino. So if you have a bar in the casino and people say to themselves, you know what, I feel like a drink. I don't care to gamble, but this place has a great bar. Let me go to that, uh, that casino. That going to the casino is the very, one of the first basic shaping things that a casino needs you to do in order for you to gamble. So the same way in Sniffy, that the first thing, sorry for this rat, the program's name is Sniffy, but the same thing for this rat, the first thing we need to do is just get him close to the bar. Just get him in the back half of the cage, right? That's the first part of shaping the bar press. 
The first part of shaping any gambling is to get people into the casino. So bars are one way that you can get people into a casino. What are other ways? Wedding receptions. Why are there weddings at a casino, right? Gets people there. Is that why they send out the like incentivizing like advertising or like the companies who will send you a certain amount of money and then they're going to Exactly. That's why they'll have, oh here's two hundred free dollars in chips if you come and you know come to our casino. Other things, yep. So I know like in Michigan City they have like a casino that has a built in hotels and it's like one of the nicer hotels. So if you're coming from out of the state, mm -hmm. you're gonna want to stay at the nicest hotel and so then you can go to that one and then Exactly. Um, so nice hotels to get you into again that just that basic shaping of that particular behavior. So many of the things that casinos have, when I was living in Reno, the best restaurants were the ones in the casinos. Every single time I wanted sushi, it was one of two places and they were both in casinos. Um, the best shows, you know, why would a casino spend millions of dollars booking entertainment when for the entire hour and a half that you're watching the concert or watching the show, you're not gambling, right? That's the one thing you can't do when you're you know, watching a concert, you can't be out there gambling. It's to get people in there, it's to do that first step of that shaping to make sure that at the very least they now have you doing the behavior of going to the casino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like most casinos that do have like the hotels, they have like daycares for your kids. I know like one that my sister used to take them out to the mall. Oh yeah? She used to take me and my niece and nephew with her for the weekend and we would go into this little like daycare thing inside of the casino. Wow. So, I have never so, like, heard you can't have like your kids. Well, excuse like you have your kids if you eat the Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and that. They drop their kids off, they play games, and they don't pick them up for like an And they provide like lunch for your kids and everything. That that also reminds me, and that that's a that's a good example of other shaping. So Chuck E. Cheese with games can be thought of as a casino, right? I mean, what is it other than try this game of of skill and see if you can win some tickets? And oh, here you can go cash it in for prizes. That's exactly what a casino is, right? Try your hand at the roulette wheel, see if you can win some chips, and then you can cash it over there for money. Chuck E. Cheese, you know, try the ski ball, see if you can win some tickets, and you can get that five cent plastic ring over there, you know, after spending all that, all that money. So that can be thought of as shaping as well. And that's actually one of the, uh, the big controversies right now in, uh, in terms of uh, in video games. If you remember, we brought, the, uh, we brought up the idea of ratio spraying last time in video games. One of the big legal issues right now in video games is loot boxes. So loot boxes are uh, um, kind of treasure boxes that you can get in a video game where you can get like high level uh, gear, you can get you know, the latest guns, you can get a great lightsaber, you can get a costume for your, uh, you know, for your character. But because of the modern video game landscape, they actually can, you can actually pay money for those. And the argument in a lot of countries has been that they want to ban those because it's gambling. It's literally children, because you can be a child and, and uh, play this, paying $10 to see if they can get this high-end you know, lightsaber, and that is not, uh, that is, many people are arguing, you know, gambling. At the very least, it's shaping, or it's gambling, increasing that uh, probability of that behavior. Any other uh, potential shapings? I think that's about all that I could think of. All right. Oh, one last one. Um, the, uh, and this is, this is tied to the, um, uh, the free money, right? So oftentimes casinos will be like, oh, you get $20 in free chips you know, for coming here tonight. Uh, often also they'll have like a free poll, right? So you go to it, you get like one on your visit, you give them the voucher and you're like, you know, it's a big, huge slot machine and you get to pull it down. Uh, the free pull is also an example of shaping because it gets you to do that very low probability, uh, sorry, very high probability behavior who's not gonna take something free, hoping to shape you into those low probability behaviors of gambling huge amounts of money. All right, so uh, let's say that you then, um, let's, we'll, we'll flip it now. So we looked at a lot of things that are gonna increase uh, the behavior. And basically what happens in the mind of somebody that's been conditioned is that all of these, uh, all of these associations are, are strengthened. 
So the sound has been uh, strengthened in association with the reinforcer. The actual action has been associated with that uh, secondary reinforcer sound. And that makes the probability of the action much higher, the strength of the action much higher. So what can you do if you're a psychologist? What can you do in order to get rid of this? If somebody comes to you and says, I have a gambling addiction. So one thing that you can do is you can actually go through extinction. And extinction is where you um, present that, uh, you present the um, uh, response, sorry, you have the response occur, but without the reinforcer. So in extinction, we'll see this in chapter eight, for operant conditioning, that's where the response occurs, but now you're no longer being reinforced uh, for the response. And that would be what you would do if you were trying, one of the ways that you can try to treat somebody uh, for gambling addiction would be to have them go through the responses, but not ever be reinforced with a win, not ever receive other reinforcers. So uh, you can imagine that this has to be what normally occurs, right? If you go into a casino, most of the time, people are doing a particular response without receiving the primary reinforcer, right? So most of the times when you play that slot machine, you don't win, right? Most of the times when you press that button, you end up a loser. That's how slot uh, casinos make their money. So almost every single trial at a casino, at a slot machine, is gonna be an extinction trial, right? Every single one is going to lessen the probability that these individuals are gonna play. And they'll go on huge losing streaks, which will lessen the probability that they're gonna to continue to play if other things weren't happening. So there has to be other factors involved that increase the amount of time that they're gonna play. So let's take a look at some of those factors. So extinction here, so let's say that we wanted to extinct, uh, go through extinction for the bar press here. We didn't want our rat pressing the bar any longer. What we can do is we can put it into an extinction uh, an extinction procedure where the hopper no longer comes up, right? So the hopper is disabled, you press the bar, and it doesn't come up. So not only do you not get the food, but you also don't get the sound. And if that's the case, looking at the rat's little line there, if that's the case, what you would find is that the strength between the bar and the sound goes down because pressing the bar now no longer creates a sound so you don't get that secondary reinforcer. And because of that, the strength of the bar press goes down and down. Notice the association between sound and food did not go down because the sound is not being played and the food is not being presented, so those two have, have not been affected. But the sound, uh, the, the strength of the bar and the sound association will go down, the strength of the actual bar press will go down, and eventually your rat will quit pressing your bar. So the question is, if this rat quit pressing the bar when it did not receive any food, why is it that slot machine players will continue pressing the bar even though they've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars? So you remember that woman that lost $250,000. How is this extinction avoided in, in uh, slot machines, in casinos? So any ideas what that might what might be uh, happening here? Mm -hmm. um, like large amounts of reinforcement, aka receiving a lot of money very rarely, or seeing somebody. So large amounts of money, uh, but even though it's uh, it's rare, was one of the contributing factors. So one of the patterns that they found in a lot of uh, people that develop gambling addiction is a big early win. So if you go to the casino for your first time and you hit that huge jackpot you are much more likely to develop a gambling problem than somebody who you know, didn't have success early on. So that's one factor to keep them pressing the bar. Yep? Um, I know if you lose a lot of money, they actually will give you money. It's called a comp. They'll give you money for food or for the stores or something. Yeah. Um, so like if you lose $2,000, they'll give you like 40 bucks. And to some people it's like, oh, well, I didn't lose all my money because I got to eat food because they gave you money. Well, that would actually be re- so another way to think of that is you're getting reinforced for losing, which would make you have a higher probability or frequency of losing in the future, or being willing to lose in the future. So that's another way of doing it. Any other ideas? Yep. Kind of making the sound rewarded instead of 
So that's one of the one of the uh, big ways we'll go over. The sound is the reward. So even though you're not getting hit with money all the time, if you can make that sound rewarding through that magazine training we were talking about, that can be used to continue that reinforcement. You have, you have an idea? Or um, is it? Some machines have bonuses. So even if you're losing, you build certain steps to get to the mega jackpot. OK, so you can build your bonuses. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Yep. Uh, like you take one step forward, so they give you like, oh, like you win like two coins. But you have to spend like five to so like move forward. So it's like a step forward and switch back. Mm -hmm. But you see that step forward as progress. So in that case, you're you're kind of being reframed to get uh, get reinforced every single time, not as actual money, but as actual progress. So that was kind of the the, the theme in both of those. So that's the case as well. So uh, the the key here, though, uh, and the kind of underlying theme to a lot of these is that there's multiple sources of reinforcement. So even though they cut that primary one, even though you're not getting money every single time, you're getting the sound, you're getting progress, right? You're getting these other things every single time, and that is the idea of that secondary reinforcement. So secondary reinforcement is when you have a, another stimulus, a secondary stimulus, that can act as a reinforcer because of its prior association with the primary reinforcer. So it's not like any stimulus will do. It has to be associated with that primary reinforcer. So things like uh, sound is associated with that primary reinforcer. Things like progress are associated with that primary reinforcer in casinos, and we'll get to that real, real quick. But if the sound is associated with the primary reinforcer, and we get to the point where the sound becomes a conditioned stimulus, specifically though, one that can act as a secondary reinforcer because it was paired with that primary reinforcer, then you can reinforce behaviors like approaching that bar with nothing but sound. So you can reinforce a rat with nothing but sound once the sound has been associated with food enough. You can reinforce a dog with nothing but sound once that sound has been associated with food enough. And if you go through an extinction procedure, but this time, we do not turn off the sound of the hopper. So this time, we empty the hopper, right? The hopper holds the food. We just take all the food out. So every single time that bar is pressed, the hopper comes up, and the rat looks into it, and it's empty. And it presses the bar again, hopper comes up, makes a sound, the rat looks inside, it's empty once again. Just that sound will keep the extinction going and going and going. So you can see that in the previous example, the rat went up once, twice, and then just quit. But when it has the sound there as a secondary reinforcer, and every single time you press that bar, you still hear that sound, it will continue to press the bar for much, much longer before it finally decides that enough is enough. So all those sources of secondary reinforcement work to keep these individuals pressing that button, even though the primary reinforcer of money cannot come as often as it would need to to maintain this behavior without those secondary reinforcers. So that hearing of that sound, the hearing of other people winning, ding, 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 oh, I've been reinforced for pressing my bar, I've been reinforced for staying in the situation, that keeps the, that keeps the, uh, the behavior uh, from going through extinction. And uh, the idea of progression was brought up, the idea of making progress towards your goal, and that is the reason why slot machines look like this. And it's to keep people from going through extinction even though they're not winning every single time, even though they're not being presented with that primary reinforcer. Because literally, Hitting, uh, doing a behavior and not getting reinforced for it is how you go through extinction. How do you keep people from going through extinction? You can remove the primary reinforcer, but you have to have secondary reinforcers. And this is one of the best secondary reinforcers that are there. So in a typical slot machine, that tumbler will stop first, and it'll stop on something, it might stop on two chairs. 
And then this tumbler would stop, and it would stop on two chairs, and you'd be like, ooh, I got two in a row. And then this tumbler would stop, and it would stop on two chairs, and you'd be like, yes, you know, I won this round. So what's going on here during the early conditioning? First time you step, you sit down to a slot machine. If somebody showed you a cherry, you'd be like, eh, it's a cherry. If somebody showed you a diamond, you'd be like, it's a nice picture of a diamond. They would basically be neutral stimuli. For our purposes, we're going to take a look at matches, right? So if you did not know at all what was going on in the slot machine, and a friend of yours just said, oh yeah, just sit down here and, and give it a whirl. And you're like, I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? I've never seen one of these before. I don't know what it is. And they're like, just pull the handle. So you pull the handle, and this one comes up. And uh, importantly, this one is always going to be a match, right? Your first tumbler that stops is going to be a match. Whether it's a cherry, you've matched cherries. If it's a diamond, you've matched diamond, right? You're, there's no way it can't be a match. So we have match number one, and that one pops up, and you're looking at it, and you're going, all right, I got a cherry. Neutral stimulus. Match number two pops up, another cherry. And you're like, all right, two cherries in a world. I guess it's a nice picture. I don't know what it means. Neutral stimulus. Match number three comes up, another cherry. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird. Three cherries in a row, and neutral stimulus. Then the money comes out. Then you get that, you know, bing, 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 and you get all the money coming out. That money is an unconditioned stimulus that leads to the unconditioned response of the positive emotion. And this is the setup for every single play of a slot machine. So what, is, what happens in this situation? Well, notice that we're pairing, we'll, we'll break it down piece by piece. Notice that we're pairing match three with the unconditioned stimulus of money. The neutral stimulus of match three is being paired with the unconditioned stimulus of money. Once that third match occurs, it is followed by money. Remember that the association of a stimulus with the primary reinforcer can lead to that stimulus becoming a secondary reinforcer. So this match three becomes a secondary reinforcer. It becomes condition stimulus number one. It becomes the, the primary condition stimulus. Now, remember through secondary conditioning, higher order conditioning, uh, if you go back to uh, the celebrity endorsements, we now have, go back to match two. Match two is a neutral stimulus. Match two is not associated with the money, right? It's too far temporarily. It's, it's not temporally contiguous. But match two is directly followed by match three. And if match three becomes a conditioned stimulus, that conditioned stimulus can change this neutral stimulus into a higher order, better pop up, higher order conditioned stimulus. And now this higher order condition stimulus that follows this neutral stimulus can turn it into an even higher order condition stimulus. So now we have the part, now we have the situation where every single time that you win that money, that increases the condition stimulus properties of match number three. Every single time you get to match number three, that increases the condition stimulus properties of match number two. And every single time you get to match number two, that can, uh, increases the condition stimulus properties of match number one. And what this means is that all of those three condition stimuli can cause the conditioned response of positive emotion. And you'll see this. Once people become seasoned slot players, they don't just cheer when they get the money. They cheer when they get, ooh, I got that first cherry. And then they're like positive emotions. Ooh, I got that second cherry, right? There's positive emotions, the conditioned response, once those matches are conditioned. So far, so good? All right. So these become conditioned stimuli. Importantly, they become secondary reinforcers. So when you are actually, after conditioning, pulling on that handle, when you're pressing that button, you might not win every single time. You might not get that primary reinforcer of money every single time, but you will guaranteed get one match every single time because something's gonna come up on that first dial. It might be a diamond, guess what? You match diamonds. It might be a cherry, guess what? You match cherries. That first match right there is always gonna be reinforcing. 
for that button press. And then if you get a second match, well then that button press has been reinforced twice. And if you get a third match, well we won't do the third match because that leaves the money. But if you get match number one, which you always will, button press has been reinforced. If you get match number two, which you sometimes will, button press gets reinforced. And even if you fail on match number three, that button press is already been reinforced twice. Twice, every, almost every single trial. At least once, almost every single trial. So this is why this is still around. Because once this one stops, you've been reinforced. If this one stops and matches, you've been reinforced. If this one stops and doesn't match, you've been reinforced twice already with no money whatsoever, and that keeps you from going through extinction. So I could barely keep this one straight when I was analyzing it. So you can imagine the psychological reinforcement that's going on when you can match five columns, three different rows, and lines and connections between those. You're getting secondarily reinforced so much without ever getting any money, without ever getting that primary reinforcer, and that keeps you from going through that extinction process. All right, any questions about that? So that is the mystery explained of why slot machines look like this now, rather than just being, you know, you've, uh, you've won or you haven't won. All right, a couple of more things before we uh, wrap up our look at uh, addiction. Uh, spontaneous recovery. So you'll recall spontaneous recovery in classical conditioning. We also have spontaneous recovery in operational conditioning. So spontaneous recovery in operational conditioning, that's where you get the reappearance of a previously extinguished operant response. Once you take a break from that environment and then you come back to that environment. So much like in classical conditioning, where we rang the bell with no food, rang the bell with no food, rang the bell with no food until the dog no longer salivated. Then the dog went home for the night, came back to the lab the next day, and the first time we rang the bell, the dog started salivating again, spontaneous recovery. We have spontaneous recovery as well for operant behaviors. So when we uh, took our rat here through uh, the extinction procedure, this simulation actually allows you to put Sniffy, uh, put the rat in timeout. So let's see what happens to his mind when he's put in timeout. So timeout simulates 24 hours out of the testing environment, out of that Skinner box. And if you put Sniffy in timeout, once the rat comes back, it will start bar pressing. And notice it will bar press. So we got the bar press right down here because the thought balloon was kind of covering it. Notice, number one, that once you get him back into timeout, so this is pre-timeout, this is why he, while he's away from the environment, the mind window, once he comes back in timeout, recovers a lot of those associations, the association of the bar with the sound, the association of actually pressing the bar, so that once he's placed back into this situation, Sniffy will start pressing that bar again without being reinforced. The reinforcement is turned off He's receiving no food whatsoever. But once they come back from timeout, they'll start pressing that bar again until they go through the extinction process one more time. And just to kind of show you how insidious this can be, if we put him in timeout again, another 24 hours away, without ever reinforcing him, and then bring him back into that testing situation, he will spontaneously recover one more time. And it'll take repeated exposures in this way before there is no spontaneous recovery anymore, before the bar press is completely uh, extinguished. And this spontaneous recovery is probably the best reason why if you are recovering from any sort of addiction or any sort of bad behavior, you do not want to go anywhere where that bad behavior was uh, conditioned, where it was trained. So if you're dealing with uh, gambling addiction, you do not go to casinos because if you step back into the environment, you might get spontaneous, go through spontaneous recovery. So you might go to a therapist and the therapist might work with you and go through the entire extinction procedure and you might sit there and say, you know what, I've, I'm cured. I feel 
no urge to gamble whatsoever. I, I haven't wanted to gamble for like the last you know, three weeks. I, I, I've, I've beaten it. I don't have the urge to gamble anymore. Oh, my favorite, uh, you know, my favorite music stars are playing at the casino. I guess I'll go to the casino. Walk through that door, spontaneous recovery, all of a sudden you're like, I, I, I gotta gamble. I feel like I need to gamble. It'll come back, spontaneous recovery. And that's why in programs like Alcohols Anonymous, they tell you, especially during the early portions, do not go back to that environment. Do not go back to the bars. Do not go back to, in this case, the casino. Uh, don't go back to those areas that you've been in before because even if you feel like you have no urges to do it whatsoever outside of the environment, through that, and I, honestly, I'm hoping one day I'll find a benefit for spontaneous recovery, but through spontaneous recovery, when you go back into that environment, that action strength comes back up and you feel that urge again, and that's why people relapse when they get placed back into the same environment. And uh, one, uh, one place that I always find uh, spontaneous <laughs> recovery occurs, and some of you are probably gonna go through this in November, um, just to make this a little bit more of a common experience. If you're living away from your parents, and then you go back and visit your parents, see how many childlike behaviors just spontaneously recover. So you might be living on your own, and you're doing your own laundry, you're cooking your own food, you're an independent person living an independent life, you go back to your parents' house for Thanksgiving, and all of a sudden, doing laundry just feels like the biggest chore in the world because your parents did your laundry. Cooking your food seems like the biggest chore in the world because your parents did your food. Basically, all those childlike behaviors come back up because you've gone through extinction of those childlike behaviors when you're living on your own. You go back to your parents' house and you're like, oh, I'm gonna be all independent. No, pops back up, and all of a sudden, all those childish kind of behaviors that you used to have, you don't even, you just kind of fall right back into them. Same thing happens with more extreme, you know, and dangerous uh, behaviors. All right, I think that's about it. Any final comments or stuff that, uh, contributions, anything? Good for the week. All right, so that is it. I will see you in a week. Enjoy your uh, fall break. And uh, I will post those exam grades as soon as I can. But uh, other than that, we are done for today. <laughs>